So, welcome everyone to the Rig Run Recovery Zone. Um, my name is Shona King and I'm going to be hosting today's webinar on behalf of Rig Run. So just a wee reminder that the session is being recorded and it will be available on the Rikaran Recovery Zone website. And for those of you that are watching live, if you're able to turn your cameras and mics off now, that would be great. But if you do have any questions about today's session, just pop them into the chat and we'll try to get to those at the end. So today we're joined by Tom Gurney and he's an exercise physiologist and a lecturer at University College London. So welcome, Tom. Uh, Tom's going to talk about the impact of working night shifts um, on both body and mind. And I guess that's a subject that might be particularly relevant to many of those working offshore. And he's also going to give us some good tips about optimum nutrition and how that, how that can help with working shifts overnight. So thanks very much, and over to you, Tom. Thank you very much. I'm just going to start sharing my screen. Just to confirm you can see my screen and slides? Yes, we can. Thanks. Great, thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, so yeah, my name is Tom Gurney, lecturer at University College London, and my main research interests are supplementation for health and exercise performance. Um, so today the, the slides are, are going to be roughly split into three sections talking about how uh, the, the night shift affects our circadian rhythm uh, and with regards to our body and our mind. Then going to talk about some possible strategies in which you can employ when you're on a night shift to optimise your nutrition and health. Um, and then at the back end we're going to talk about a couple of supplements that you might be worth considering uh, whether you're on the oil rig or also at home as well. So what do we mean? by circadian rhythm well the, the name actually comes from a latin diminutive meaning uh, circa and diam which means around the day and it's not a new notion one of the first reports was in 1729 where they were looking at the differences in plant biology and how the plant leaves were changing depending on the night and day cycle we know our circadian clocks roughly uh, work to about 24 hours, sometimes a little bit more than that. And this figure here just gives you a little bit of a demonstration about how our biology changes throughout these uh, throughout this 24 hour time period as well. And I'll be going into a little bit of detail into some of these areas uh, throughout the next few slides. But it's really important that we try and keep our circadian rhythm um, as consistent as possible. But there is individualized responses to uh, our circadian rhythm. So for example, some individuals may prefer uh, being up early and their circadian rhythm may start at an earlier time of the day. So I know certainly I am a lion uh, in this figure graph, uh, but individuals will vary depending on, on when they uh, wake up and when they start to experience some light within uh, their 24 hour time period. So what controls our circadian rhythm? Rhythm. And what really is it? Well, within our brain, we have what we have called as the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And this nucleus is in charge, is the main central output in charge for uh, monitoring and keeping our circadian rhythm in sync. And there are three main time cues. We have light, which is one of the main ones. We also have our feeding schedule and our activity as well. But it's also important to note that we also have some uh, peripheral outputs or peripheral clocks within our bodies. It's not just the mind, but also we have internal and independent clocks within our heart, our liver and our muscle and our kidney. And these are all fine tuned to uh, be appropriate to the 24 hour day cycle. This super charismatic nucleus is essentially the control center. And this is where one of the main areas in which it takes uh, control for our circadian rhythm. Those of you who typically eat at a, at a relatively normal uh, breakfast, lunch and dinner will know that our feeding schedules are quite important when it comes to um, uh, controlling our circadian rhythm. I'll be going into a little bit about meal timing in a couple of time and how important that is through our nutrition. But unfortunately, I guess it could be considered unfortunately, in the 21st century, we are uh, prone to having this 24 hour cycle where we have the availability of consistent um, food availability. So 24 hour, for example, dry drive-throughs, we also have entertainment screen time and it wasn't always this way and so our biology clocks and our circadian rhythms are having to adapt consistently to this. 
you turn your uh, attention to the figure up on the top right hand side over here, you can see that normally our time our time window for eating is roughly between 7 a.m. up until about 6, 7 p.m. more or less. But when we start to change our circadian rhythm or our eating patterns, this can have a negative effect on our uh, metabolic responses for when we start eating our food. So this can cause an increase in our weight gain, potentially start having a negative effect on our glucose intolerance. And for those of you who work night shifts will know that you are definitely more prone to start eating during this nighttime period where we would typically be far. So meal timing is actually really, really important for our metabolism. And it's actually now been suggested that eating at the wrong time of the day is a significant risk factor rather than how much we eat. And so eating at the wrong time of day can lead to some, some significant factors such as cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes and also obesity as well. And this is particularly uh, prominent in the individuals who work night shift. It's also important to note here that sleep plays a major role in the types of food choices we make. The more tired you are, the less sleep you have, there is more likelihood that you're going to crave these calorie dense carbohydrates, sugary foods uh, and takeaways, for example. And so it's really important to also think about our meal timing for, for our food choices, but also how much we're drinking as well, which can also play a big role. And I'll be talking about caffeine in, in uh, a little bit later on in this talk. So what happens then when our circadian rhythm becomes misaligned? Well, there's a lot of literature to suggest that night shift workers are unfortunately prone to a lot more uh, long term health conditions such as cardiovascular disease and, uh, and diabetes. What normally happens with our circadian alignment is we have our central clock and our, our peripheral clocks working in this nice oscillating pattern in a nice, simple way. And note here we've got our cues or our light cues are sleeping at night and our food intake with our normal uh, restricted window. But when we have this misalignment, this is where our central clock and our peripheral clocks get confused. So remember our peripheral clocks could include our liver or our kidneys. And so if we start eating at the wrong time of day, then these clocks are going to become out of sync to our central clock. And one of the key cues, as I said, is food, uh, but of course light at night as well. And of course, sleeping during the day. And as I've already alluded to, this has some significant issues with metabolic processes uh, associated with, with circadian misalignment. What's important to note here, though, is all of these black circles are also associated with physiological uh, uh, inactivity, uh, phys um, inactive phys uh, activity. Sorry. Um, so it's important to note that we can actually probably try and mitigate or these effects by doing some sort of exercise, which is, I guess, a promising thing. There's also, of course, a lot of research to suggest that uh, a circadian rhythm can also have um, significant impact on our cognition in, in shift workers. And this can be particularly uh, problematic for individuals who may work in machinery uh, or any, any large sort of uh, tasks that include uh, a lot of uh, cognition uh, tasks. And so you can see here in the in the, the red boxes where we've got the misaligned group where there's a significant worse reaction time and a significantly uh, higher amount of attention lapses as well when you have a misaligned circadian rhythm. And as I briefly just alluded to, this can have a, a serious major safety concern, particularly for those of you that might operate large or heavy machinery where it's really important to be working in a safe environment. But don't worry, because there are some strategies in which we can employ to mitigate some of these risks. Uh, I've briefly gone over some of the risk factors here with regards to talking about some of uh, the, the, the risks of overweight and obesity. But what's really interesting is there's now some research coming out to suggest that there is a difference between male and females with, our, with regards to our circadian uh, misalignment. And this paper was published just a few months ago, suggesting that actually females have a better and stronger circadian alignment in comparison to their male counterparts. So, yes, although shift work does include a significant increase in comparison to no shift work with regards to metabolic syndrome. But when we compare male versus female, there seems to be less likelihood of, of females uh, uh, having metabolic syndromes due to shift work. And this is also apparent when we, we match it with the, the jobs that um, they also entail as well. 
And as I said, don't worry too much. There are strategies you can employ to mitigate these risks, and we're going to be going through them in a slide in a slide or two time. But just to stress some of the factors that might influence some of your behaviour uh, changes when when you are on a shift, it's really important. It was completed in 2019 where they took 62 uh, papers and had a, a massive review and tried to find some key themes in which why shift factors may, uh, shift workers may eat on shift. So they had four key themes, which was when, what, where and why. And the larger the bubble, uh, the more the theme was prominent within the papers. But what I wanted to really focus on was the why shift workers eat on uh, um, during their shift. Eating with colleagues was quite a significant factor. So this perhaps there's this social element of eating with individuals during these hours. Of course, there's some health and alertness areas to consider. But what I wanted to talk about as well is the stress. So if you have a particularly stressful environment or perhaps your shift isn't going particularly well, you're more likely to turn to a donut or some high sugary foods, particularly at, uh, during the night time when maybe perhaps there are some healthier options available. So we're going to talk about now some possible strategies that you can consider when you're working um, on a night shift and certainly there's a few things we can do beforehand where possible get yourself exercising particularly when you're working up towards your rig run events really really good to strengthen your circadian rhythm there and also prevent weight gain it also has some significant impact on uh, alleviating depression uh, and various other cognitive benefits as well where you have the possibility of doing so uh, try and select some complex carbohydrates on your food so opting for whole meal food choices uh, seeded options brown rice for example if that isn't uh, available for you then try and go for some lean proteins as well uh, so thinking about maybe some salmon some eggs some beef um, and then also some healthy fats is all really really good especially for your cognition and reducing cardiovascular uh, disease as well Hydration also plays a really important role um, with regards to making sure that you're selecting the correct food choices um, and of course caffeine as well and we'll be talking about caffeine in a couple of slides time into a little bit more detail. During the night shift is, is each equally got some important points and strategies for you to consider. Again I stress the water bottle, bring a water bottle along with you it's going to encourage you a lot more to drink some water but electrolytes if you've got the capability of bringing this in your bag when you get onto the helicopter uh, uh, going onto the rig you can perhaps uh, load up on a couple of these tubes which will replace the electrolytes particularly if you're working in a hot environment or something that's physically demanding and these little tablets can be dropped into some water um, and they're packed with electrolytes which should hopefully um, rehydrate you a lot quicker where possible, bring some fruits, some nuts and some nutrient dense yogurts with uh, with you across if you're thinking you're going to be a little bit peckish during the night. Alternatively, on your on your break, go for some of these as your food option as well. And I know it's really difficult to say and do, but avoiding sugary uh, high processed foods is really, really important. For example, I tend to term this the sort of the empty calories, where if you look at five star bursts, has 100 calories in. in to a medium banana match for the calories this banana is going to fill you up a lot more than five star bursts will and also it's got a lot more of the the healthy nutrients and vitamins and minerals in there too what's it been interesting and in coming out of the literature so far recently is talking about this danger zone and eating between the hours of 1 a.m and 5 a.m is seen to be quite a negative thing to happen and i'm going to going to go through a couple of these papers so this is paper published in 2020 and this paper here was published um, in 2021, where they're actually trying to encourage individuals who work on shift uh, work to try and stop eating between the hours of one and five. If we think about your natural circadian rhythm, and if you think about what you'd be doing during the one and five normally, you would normally be, be in your deepest sleep. And so during this time, there's a lot of literature to suggest that actually our carbohydrate and fat metabolism is really really inefficient and that's what tends to lead to this increase in weight gain because you're just not so good at burning that energy and so the research is generally recommending at the moment that if you fast between the hours of one and five like you would normally this can support weight loss and also potentially mitigate the metabolic consequences of, of night shift work as well when we think about caffeine again you can it's really important to think about the timing here we know that it can lead to an improving cognitive function, improved alertness, and also if you're working in high physical demanding uh, areas, it can 
reduce your perception of how hard you're working. The key thing to remember about uh, caffeine is to front load it where possible. OK, so have your caffeine at the early uh, or the beginning of your shift um, and then make sure you try and stop consuming it eight hours before you intend to sleep. Caffeine has a half life of about five hours um, and then it will eventually leave your body in, a, in about 11 hours. OK, so just try and hit that sweet spot of, of eight, eight hours before you go to sleep. If you're really struggling, a good alternative would be to turn to herbal teas. Some of the posh ones as well have some nice uh, vitamins and minerals in there, poly in there as well. Um, I'm not saying twinings are the posh ones, but, you know, you, you can have a look at some of uh, what's on the market and have a think about something that might mitigate some of your cravings for, for caffeine. We often talk about what we should do before and during a night shift, but we don't really tend to talk about what we should do finishing a night shift. And this type of preparation can be really important, particularly if you're doing two or three night shifts in a row. And one of the suggested mechanisms or, or sorry, one of the suggested strategies to try and avoid this blue light. Remember in my first slide where we, t we spoke about how light is one of the key cues for your circadian rhythm. If you can try and block out some of this blue light by investing in some blue light glasses or at the very least putting the filter on your phone on, this can hopefully uh, stop the confusion within your brain with, with functioning uh, and, and trying to turn on your circadian rhythm. There's also a lot of new literature out there now that suggests that having a protein rich breakfast can be really beneficial. So as soon as you get, as soon as you finish your shift, protein rich breakfast eggs is, is a good uh, really healthy option for protein there or tofu for example uh, and this improves your sleep efficiency by uh, quite a lot my fiance is actually a night shift worker um, and she's started to adopt this approach recently over the last few months and she says that she's sleeping a lot better she normally wakes up in the middle of the day hungry but now she seems to sleep all the way through and think about these light cues again so if you can invest in some in some eye masks and earplugs and that can really help you with your sleep efficiency once you've finished the night shift it's all well and good me giving you some some top tips but there is just some literature to suggest whether or not and ask night shift workers whether this type of uh these strategies are feasible which is really interesting and this paper was published um just last year and it was largely suggested to be affected by three major influences and this is the physical and emotional burden you may have on your shift and this will then have a negative effect on your food temptations also about the workplace context do you have a good break environment i know this can vary depending on the type of shift you work um, and also thinking about your social and cultural context as well and of course i think it goes without saying motivation of the individual can be really important but on the topic of motivation, if you decide to have a coworker to buddy up with, if you're thinking about fasting between the hours of one and five, this can really facilitate and help you with regards to managing and mitigating the risks associated with weight gain and metabolic syndrome with night shift working. Hopefully as well, a little bit of education will also help you to reconsider what you might be eating and drinking during the night. But I appreciate completely that there are some barriers to, to, to this and of course we have to remember the emotional and physical toll of working these nights and it can be really difficult to refrain you know turning to that donut when you've had a really difficult few hours so some last little practical tips on this section then um really mealtime plan really really important you may not necessarily be able to prepare if you're if you're uh, on on the rig but you can certainly plan as much as possible with regards to when you going to eat and what you're going to eat as, as best you can if you do start getting some cravings i tend to find that sugar-free gum can be really beneficial uh, for helping you uh, mitigate those cravings keep hydrated and as i said on that previous slide buddy up with someone that can be really helpful in trying to uh, stay strict as possible i'm going to move on to some supplements to consider now for for doing the night shift um, or, or recovering from a night shift but i think it's really important to first mention that where practically possible it's really important to have a food first approach um and it's difficult to perhaps do this when you maybe have a cantina and perhaps what is available available for you is what you get but there are some supplements that you can use to, to maybe uh, to help you with your nutritional needs and this paper was published last year where they were mainly talking about food first approach 
but it's not always food only. And we're going to talk about some of these possibilities, possible supplements that may be beneficial uh, for night shift workers. It's worth mentioning right now that there is so many supplements to consider, um, ranging from a whole host of things. But what I wanted to focus on today is vitamin D and mel melatonin as much as possible. Um, and, and, and you can normally get most of your melatonin from natural uh, supplements and natural herbs. Um, but it's also worth considering protein shakes and bars may be beneficial for you if you want to up your protein and also some natural food uh, sources for magnesium as well. So let's talk about vitamin D. Well, this is known as the sunshine vitamin, and this is because 90 percent of our vitamin D is derived from the sun. The other 10 percent mostly comes from our foodstuffs. It's a fat soluble protein, which means that we hang on to it quite well. Uh, but that also means that if you overload with vitamin D, this can also be problematic. Those of you that uh, do a lot of night shifts uh, or sleep for the majority of your sunlight hours, this can have uh, a more a higher risk of having a vitamin D deficiency. And it's also been li linked to having uh, more uh, chance of receiving or uh, having upper respiratory tract symptoms and illnesses as well. Rather worryingly, around 49% of individuals in 2021 were not aware of the government guidelines for taking vitamin D. And this is to take during winter and autumn periods, but this should also be individualised for those of you who work a lot of nighttime shifts as well. One in six adults are now suggested to be uh, vitamin D deficient, but the recommendations are around 800 to 1000 IU a day where possible. If you think you work a lot of night shifts and you really don't get a lot of sun, it's definitely worth investing in a 2000 IU supplement, uh, certainly uh, to try and recover or recuperate some of your vitamin D status. The good thing about vitamin D is it does come in a lot of different forms. You've got tablets, gummies, capsules and drops, and you can also get it in multivitamin packets as well. Vitamin D is known to be really important for bone health, but it also helps stimulate our muscle protein synthesis. And our muscle protein synthesis is all about helping building and regenerating our muscles from exercise. So particularly if you're recovering from exercise, uh, vitamin D and some protein can be really beneficial. Um, but as I said to you previously, it's been associated with a higher stress fracture risk rate. And particularly for those individuals who might exercise in higher stress, uh, environments such as running for example it's well known if we do recover uh, from our vitamin d status this can reduce our stress factor by about 20 percent i spoke a little bit about on that previous slide about vitamin d and exercise but as i said for those individuals who have a low vitamin d status uh, it's certainly more prevalent to to receiving uh, stress fractures due to high impact in in the lower body okay so the legs um, particularly there is some evidence to suggest that vitamin D can have an impact on performance, but normally only if you're deficient. So in this study here, there's around a four to six percent variation in our running time performance. And this was mainly due to the status of the vitamin D of the individuals. When these individuals were then corrected for their for their vitamin D status, that then was no significant impact on performance. So it almost has a sort of indirect effect effect on performance. So if you are deficient, it probably will be having some sort of impact on your exercising. So certainly consider doing this if you are working a lot of night shifts or certainly during the winter months as well. So in summary, try your best to get it from uh, for vitamin D rich foods. But normally during those winter months, you definitely need to be supplementing around 800 to 1000 IU a day. Um, and this can really help with uh, reducing the impact that this may have negatively on your health and performance. The last supplement I want to talk to you guys about is melatonin. And this is a natural hormone that is produced in the penile gland um, and it's responsible for your circadian rhythm. It plays an important role in energy metabolism as well. And one of the key cues for the for melatonin release is night and light period. So during the night time, we have the stimulation of uh, melatonin and during the daytime when we're receiving light, it inhibits our, uh, uh, our secretion of melatonin. There's some suggestions now and some research to show that it's actually quite feasible and safe intervention for individuals who may be doing night shifts. This paper suggested that actually individuals to begin with had a, a poor and concentration tasks after they supplemented with six grams of 
uh, melatonin, there was an improvement in concentration and attention tasks and also some sleep efficiency as well. When we look at females specifically, though, when, when they were ingesting three, gram, uh, three micrograms of melatonin for 45 days, there was also an improvement in the circadian misalignment. Note in this study, though, that this was focused on early types, so individuals who have particularly who wake up uh, at a certain time of day. Early type individuals are also known to have a larger circadian rhythm misalignment when they start working shifts. So you can see this misalignment here in the earlier types in comparison to um, the intermediate and the late types. But supplementing uh, with the three grams of melatonin seem to have a, a good impact on body weight and also reduce the circadian misalignment by about 21% in comparison to perhaps a 56% here that we can see in the placebo condition. So melatonin is a little bit of a grey area, and this is because that uh, in the UK, you can only get it from prescription only in its pure form. Uh, but in other areas in, in, in the world, you can get it over the counter. So please make sure you do check or consult your GP if you think you're going to need it. That said, you can get your melatonin from natural sources. So there are some really good uh, supplement that now actually include some really uh, strong melatonin sources such as tart cherry extract and ashwagandha and these can have some really good positive effects on reducing your sleep uh, sleep and also improving uh, your um, your your sleep efficiency and your recovery as well so it can be useful for resetting and recovering from three nights but you should aim to ingest it with a meal and go to bed within zero to two hours after ingesting it so just to summarise and just wrapping up, I appreciate we're quite close to time now. Really important to try and do the basics things right. And I know that's a little bit harder and uh, easier said than done. But think about your food choices actively and proactively. Think about them. Think about your hydration and your sleep when you're doing your night shifts. Where possible, plan. And you can plan your meal timing as best as possible, certainly with regards to your snacks and caffeine. Definitely. If possible as well, and if the workplace allows you uh, up on the rigs, try and invest in sort of a, a night shift survival pack where you can bring a little bag of you with some healthy snacks uh, and some water bottles, which would be really, really good um, to help you with your nutrition as well. If appropriate, consider some supplements. If you don't think your nutrition is particularly going too well, definitely in those winter months and doing a lot of night shifts, vitamin D can be really good. Think about melatonin sources as well. And by all means, definitely exercise really really good for your circadian rhythm and of course reducing and keeping off the that weight and of course for when you lead up to your rig run events as well great i am finished i'm very happy to take some uh, questions we'll have a, a quick discussion thank you so much tom i'm so pleased i'm more akin to a wolf than a bear that's just made my day <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was quite happy when I was diagnosed as a lion as well. <laughs> I bet. I don't think any of us realised um, that working shifts could have quite so much of an impact on, you know, an individual's health and well-being. So there was there was so much information there, and it's definitely a presentation that I'd like to go back and have a look through all the information again. Yeah. Um, that was brilliant. Thank you so much. I really I was interested in this concept of the danger zone. That you mentioned between yeah. 1 a.m. and 5 a.m. I thought that was really interesting and and how you recommended that individuals kind of avoid eating during those hours. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I have one question. The, the danger zone you. is is oh sorry, I was just going to say the danger zone is, is is difficult as well because that's usually when people start to flag the most as well is yeah. during that time period which is at the latter end of the shift um, and so as I said some of those strategies which I recommended can be really helpful when just trying to get you through those hours. Oh absolutely and there's a lot of, of really useful tips and hints in there as well. I mean Good. in terms of the offshore environment mo most most people work 12-hour shifts yeah. and that would generally be six to six or seven to seven something along those lines. Mm -hmm. Um, and obviously get breaks for, you know, lunch, <laughs> albeit in the middle of the night. And, and yeah. um, which is a long shift. Um, and then when you incorporate, you know, sleeping and eating in there, it doesn't leave a, a, an awful lot of time mm. for leisure activities. Um, during the rig run competition, um, people can earn points by doing up to an hour and a half an hour and a half of exercise every day so I guess my question to you was 
what time do you think would be best to do that exercise if someone is working night shift would you recommend they do their exercise before or kind of during or after their shift starts yeah so it's a really good question i would i would recommend uh, before or after um i would probably say before is probably the best because after your night shift as I said in some of those slides, it's really important to try and get to sleep as quickly as possible because there's a lot of literature to suggest that that will improve your sleep efficiency because as soon as you come out of that shift, all of a sudden you've got these light cues coming in and trying to wake you back up again or keep you awake. So where possible, try, try and do it beforehand and try and wake up maybe just that little bit earlier just to try and uh, wake up, do your exercise and then have a nice uh, healthy snack before you then go on to your shift. And that should, should normally be best if you were to do it in the middle of the night again thinking about that sort of danger zone time and i appreciate this that may be best for some people but normally during that time you are at your deepest sleep between one and five and so your body is going to get really confused if you think about your peripheral clocks a uh, peripheral clock sorry where you think about your muscle and your liver and everything else which is happening if you do exercise in that time then that may just contribute to that car uh, circadian misalignment yeah okay so ideally you know before before, before. You know, yeah. yeah and then kind of just that I guess just like a little summary that I've taken from today so you recommend front loading caffeine which is something you know I would normally do when I'm working during the day I kind of avoid any caffeine say after 2 p.m so I guess the same applies to anyone on night shift trying to avoid yeah. eight hours before they go to sleep and um, trying to avoid screens and filter out blue light after their shift and before they go to bed eating a, a protein rich breakfast which should definitely be a possibility in an offshore environment and um, although I'm not so sure tofu's on the menu that often <laughs> <laughs> um, try not to eat between one and five in the morning um, trying to try to avoid staying away from sugary snacks and I really like the concept of having a, a night shift survival pack with kind of healthier options available yeah. and plenty of water and then of course at the end you mentioned some of the supplements that might be beneficial and that includes vitamin d and melatonin have i mm -hmm. have i got all that right yeah and i think just one more for me was uh one more strategy uh which i think can be really really powerful was buddying up with someone um where possible um it can be really helpful to sort of sharing the responsibility if someone starts flagging uh then you can sort of you know give them a kick and say come on we you know we've got to get through these next couple of hours not eating or you know yeah. uh, making sure that you have some responsibility with with eating well uh, together as well and so that can certainly help um with with regards to the strategy but yeah you, you summarized that really nicely great suggestion and i think social support um in an offshore environment is really important so yeah uh, that's ideal Thank you very much for your time today, Tom. I think that was that was really useful and I hope people find the session um, interesting to look back on and uh, I'll obviously be available in the Rig Run Recovery Zone in due course. Thank you very much for having me. I hope uh, it's a nice and informative session. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Bye now. Bye.